Um, hola, oh. eh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our session uh, titled uh, Transgender Men and HIV Experiences and Vulnerabilities, Why We Should Care and Where to Go From Here. My name is Mauro Cabrera Greenspan. Uh, I am Argentinian. I am right now in Buenos Aires. And I am the executive director of GATE. GATE is an international organization. We work on gender um, identity, gender expressions, and sex characteristics. And we serve the trans, gender diverse, and intersex communities and movements. Our areas of work include the pathologization and human uh, rights, gender ideology, movement building and resourcing, resourcing um, the UN, socioeconomic justice, and of course, HIV. GATE is also the very proud host of the International Working Group on Trans Men and HIV that is organized in this session. The working group is coordinated by Max Appenroth, who is joining us today. And it works under the general direct, uh, direction of GATE's director of programs and senior expert on HIV, Erika Castellanos. This working group was created to respond to uh, an historic negative situation, which is the structural exclusion of trans men and other trans masculine people from the HIV response, including that response at the national level, the regional level, and the international level. For a long time, we have noticed the absence of trans men's issues uh, in processes of data collection and analysis, in processes of um, program design and implementation, in, in processes of monitoring and evaluation, in reporting, in prevention and treatment, in decision-making, and of course, in budget allocations, grant making, and funding. This historic exclusion of trans men and of other trans masculine people had had some very serious effects in our communities. It has contributed to naturalize the idea that trans men are just immune to HIV. And it has made many people, including many professionals and activists in the HIV field, to believe that there's nothing relevant to know about trans men and HIV. After denouncing that exclusion in many settings, including many previous HIV uh, international conferences, we decided to take a small but radical step. We decided to acknowledge the validity of our very existence, uh, the existence of our bodies, our identities, our sexualities, and our own, and the existence of our own specific vulnerability to HIV, and acknowledging the need of making our voices heard and count in the international, regional, and national responses to HIV. From that first step, it was possible to find other like us to build a collective organizing process to share and co-produce critical knowledge, to produce strategy plans and to implement them, to collect and analyze evidence of other communities and to work together to make the full inclusion of trans men and other trans masculine people in the HIV response a reality for all our communities. In a moment, once that I am finished, you are going to see a video produced by the members of the International Working Group on Trans Men and HIV. And afterwards, there will be a QA and a uh, with uh, our working group coordinator and some of our working group members. Uh, just after that, you will have the opportunity of have a live chat with, chat with Max from 4 to 5 p.m. Central European time on the Trans Networking Zone. You can also find more information about uh, this working group and in general about trans men and HIV in the GATE website at www.gate.ngo. Um, thank you very much for, for your attention. Muchas gracias por su atención and disfruten de la presentación. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you. What are the current gaps in HIV research and prevention um, regarding trans men that we know of? I think that, I mean, in most of the world, simply a total lack of data um, that people at uh, trans men and trans masculine people are just not being included in um, data collection on HIV. And so, and that, then is that lack of data is then taken as evidence that um, trans men aren't impacted by HIV. 
um, which uh, is not it's not the case. It's simply that people are not take, um, are not taking a look. Um, mm. And I think even where we there are data, it's often you know very um, no shade on San Francisco, but you know there's five small studies from one one city in one state in one country, um, and not a lot of understanding of what's happening. So in the U.S., for example. Um, the heaviest burden of HIV is actually in the U.S. South um, and among um, uh, uh, Black communities. And yet you look at the data and it's mostly um, white guys on the West Coast. And so real gaps in terms of who is being, um, whose needs are being focused on as well. And what could be the reasons, like why there is no data? I think the reason why uh, there is no data about trans, uh, trans men, we haven't been included in a lot of researches. We have been left out, and there is no funding for research for trans men. This I'm talking in the aspect of my country, in Uganda. Funding has been given to different people like the gays, the MSMs, to do research amongst them. But we haven't been given an opportunity. We haven't been given funding to do research for the trans. And uh, those that have done research about the trans people have not involved the trans, hence getting false results. So if you don't involve us, how will you get the right results? So there has, uh, people who have done research have not involved us. And uh, another thing is that uh, people who do research, most cases they mix us with other people. For example, I'll give an example of trans men being mixed up with lesbians, trans women being gay, uh, mixed up with, uh, with MSM or gay people. This is not right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why we don't have data. I guess we're from, us, from where I sit in Australia, we're seeing some really, we have seen some really similar experiences where trans men, particularly, you know, HIV vulnerable trans men, trans men that have sex with cis men in particular are just completely erased or invisible. Um, but I must say that also so are trans women and non-binary people aren't mentioned whatsoever. Uh, but in the last year, we've seen the federal uh, HIV strategy now include trans and gender diverse people as priority population um, for the first time ever. And that's really started to shift things and enable a little bit more focus on what the unique needs and risks are for this population generally. But I think Aidan and Jay are absolutely right that we are not only invisible, and not, but we're also not included. And uh, research doesn't really hit hit the mark unless the affected population, particularly in relation to HIV, are included. The root of the problem would be the, the lack of visibility and education about the trans men identity itself. Uh, because not every uh, people knows what trans men is. So when they understand about the, the identity itself and they can identify themselves and it, it will be more people who are uh, willing to visible and uh, make a community to advocate and to push the decision maker and uh, make their uh, research itself happen. So that's the root of problem is the visibility and lack of education and knowledge about the identity itself. There are a couple of pieces about the consequences of not including people in research design that I feel like are important to enumerate, like um, it's not just about making sure that people are at the table for the sake of being at the table, but because the way that cis people ask questions makes us feel like either we're not supposed to be part of the study, even if they t intend for us to be, uh, like they don't understand what our bodies look like or how they work or how we might use them, or that uh, they're not really concerned about the specifics of the way that we are impacted by the epidemic or exposed to uh, to HIV through our own practices. Um, so it's it's not just a nothing about us without us kind of philosophy, but it has really practical impacts in the quality of the data. Because really often, if I start a survey and I don't feel included, I just won't finish it, or I'll Same. only finish it half-heartedly and be like, I need to finish this, but I don't care 
about the outcome of the research anymore because they clearly didn't care about me when they designed it. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I mean, like we're in this informational space here right now. So like, I mean, let's go into the points of what do we know? Like what, what are our vulnerabilities? What are our needs? Like why do we need to be included in HIV research and prevention? Like what are some like key points? Why researchers need to in, like investigate our needs and, and, and vulnerabilities? I agree that the surveillance data tracking of actual HIV infections um, has been a huge gap here. And I think it's also really complicated by um, different areas where criminalization of HIV may be uh, impacted on how people get tested or um, uh, which can also be um, worsened by the stigma and or criminalization of a trans identity in and of itself. Um, where people may not identify themselves as uh, uh, identifying as trans when they go get tested. Uh, <clears throat> so I think um, some of the either actual legal uh, criminalization of these identities um, or um, even just stigma can, can impact how this uh, data is collected. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, I think one of the gaps is just how things like physical transition impacts the body um, and how that may or may not, um, uh, like the effects of a surgery or testosterone um, may impact how HIV interacts with the body, um, whether, uh, uh, increase or, or risk for HIV, um, there, there's a lot of data lacking on um, just uh, what happens in our body uh, with things like testosterone. I mean, you think like, uh, is this going into the direction of like discussing that, for example, prevention tools like PrEP, like how they interact with our bodies, like um, that it's actually not 100% sure how PrEP works in, in different body parts of ours since like, I mean, trans men uh, do have like receptive sex and they do have receptive sex in like many different ways. And um, that like what we know so far is that uh, it is that PrEP builds up differently in vaginal tissue, tissue compared to anal tissue. And I mean, this is something that uh, is not investigated. Like it's only investigated in cisgender women, but not in trans men. And like with the changes that you were talking about with hormones, like how the hormones change bodies, how the hormones change tissue, that it's actually up to date, not 100% clear how this interferes with the, with the shield that is built up in vaginal tissue uh, from PrEP. That and just uh, the effect of testosterone on uh, different body parts um, in yeah. uh, uh, affecting tissues to make uh, the barrier of, against uh, HIV in and of itself. I think um, for me, if I think about the risks and vulnerabilities, I can't help but think about not only the physical vulnerabilities, but also how we find ourselves situated in health systems and in legislation. I think it, it seems to me, it strikes me, and others might have a similar feeling or might disagree. It, it almost seems to me that um, the HIV response, which is largely comprised obviously of cis people, are sort of, it's sort of waiting almost for, for an epidemic to happen to trans men. Who, and it, it seems almost like there maybe won't be a particular preventative focus until, you know, something happens for our community that, uh, makes people stand up and take notice. Um, it worries me greatly that that we're really not super sure about how prep works in our bodies, and it troubles me that we have daily, uh, often, advice from different organisations suggesting that prep for men can be daily, can be episodic or events based, and and that's just not true. Uh, not only for men like me and us, but also for, I, I really do think that research that relates to body parts uh, is 
really complicated by assumptions about practice yeah. and what people do with them. And, um, you know, trans men are vulnerable to HIV in the same way as any other man is, except that we have significant barriers to accessing top-notch, high-quality healthcare because we face exceptional levels of discrimination within healthcare settings. Mm. And, and we have this extra unique experience of also needing things like gender affirming healthcare for those that seek to medically affirm who we are. And none of that is sort of considered or, or thought about in, in not only HIV research, but also implementation. Mm -hmm. um, and it leaves us quite vulnerable, I think. I mean, I think I mean, there's a lot of things here. I mean, I think there's a lot of sort of specific things about the context in which trans guys are having um, having sex. So I think, I mean, one I think one thing that I really is under discussed, um, but if for particularly for trans men, is um, people who are involved in, in sex work um, and um, and who may um, some of whom um, may be. Uh, presenting as women to work and some of whom are working um, as trans guys um, because of um, because they want to or because of rampant employment discrimination um, and um, I think there's really an assumption that that trans men don't um, do sex work and they're really invisible and not well served um, I also think that when we're thinking about people who are having um, sex not for work um, that particularly for trans men who are having sex with men um, there can be uh, a lot of issues with like power dynamics in relationships with um, with cis men and people um, in like qualitative research that I've done that people say things like you know I'm um, you know it was more important to me to to be validated um, as a guy having having sex with this with this man than to um, insist on condom use or um, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I also think there's a third thing. Oh, the third piece is also around. Um, uh, sexual assault and violence, um, and how and that being exposing people, I think particularly in settings where there are high levels of um, uh, uh, high, you know high prevalence of HIV. If you are um, sexually assaulted, the likelihood of the person who sexually assaults you being somebody who is living with HIV. Um, um, and there's there's some there's been some published research on that um, in um, in South Africa, for example, and um, and yet very little discussion of that within the HIV world. The research that does exist about trans populations and sexual violence says that among trans men, between half and two thirds have been subject to sexual violence in their lives. And that's consistent across all the studies I've ever seen. Uh, so we're not talking about minor numbers in our population. It's really massive, actually. Uh, and, and that's further complexified as, as Aiden was alluding to as well in cis gay male contexts where uh, there is this interaction between a desire to be acknowledged, affirmed as a man, and who holds the power in that interaction. Uh, it's the cis man, the cis man saying, uh, I will have sex with you, but only if we do this. I will affirm you as a, as a gay man, but only if you will do this. Um, and that happens in hookups and one-off interactions, as well as in relationships uh, when there is a cis-trans dynamic. Cis-sexism is a, is a significant problem uh, that trans men who have sex with men face in, in gay male spaces. Um, yeah. And the other piece on sexual violence that I think is really important to note is that uh, trans men, as with many lesbians, are also subject to so-called corrective rape. Uh, and I know others on this call can speak about that specifically in their contexts uh, in ways that I can't. Um, but that type of violence uh, is also something we don't talk about in a trans context uh, enough. Um, and so when we have conversations about trans people and exposure to HIV, because those conversations are largely about trans women, they presume a consent interaction, they presume a, an ability to make decisions about particular parts of their sexuality that are just not necessarily transferable over to trans men in the same conversation. Uh, and so as, as, as others were saying, you know, there's this lumping people into different groups where they don't fit. And one of the consequences is we lose this consent uh, overlay that is a, a massive component of, of trans men's sexuality. Yeah, in, as we know, Indonesia is a very, uh 
homophobic and transphobic country. Well, when in some provinces they also have a Sharia law. Uh, so the corrective rate itself is aimed to like correct a person's gender identity. So uh, when somebody rape trans men, uh, they want this trans men to turn back into a woman. That's what happened. Mm. It's uh, yeah, it's very traumatic. And uh, in one case, the uh, the fic the victim uh, was pregnant, and his family even marry him with the rapist. That's what happened. And uh, I think uh, it's uh, it's the only case that blown up because uh, the local com community are are doing the advocacy uh, for him. But uh, we don't know if there's any other corrective rape that would happen to uh, transmasculine people. I think that all of these points are so, are so in, incredibly important and nuanced to our community. And it's so important that we're talking about this and I really appreciate it. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is, is in this trans and gender diverse sexual health survey that we ran here in Australia, we found um, certainly that um, more than half of our sample of trans men had experienced sexual violence, right? But, but also the same cohort of people reported uh, really extremely low testing rates and really low levels of condom use and you know, 3% of the sample was on PrEP. No, less than that, 2% was on PrEP. Uh, and we, we start to see a sort of environment where people, you know, part of the reason why testing was so low is that people reported high levels of insensitivity within sexual health care settings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, they were much more likely not to test again because of that. So we have a number of different factors that place us at, at, at risk. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so this kind of conversation is so important. So what did, what the, what needs to change? Like we like Jay, you said earlier already. Like if we're not being asked the right questions, like what, what do we answer? Like what what needs to change? Like what can we do, or not what can we do, but like what can everyone do? I think what we need to do, we need to involve uh, a lot of trans people into research. Like when they are doing research, they need to involve the trans people, because you can't do research about me, yet you don't know about me. You don't know what I'm going through. So I think when, when people are carrying out research about trans persons, I think they need to involve us, even if we're not the ones carrying out the research, but they need to involve us. Um, another thing is that uh, donors should start funding trans projects. Uh, especially research. Stop funding other people to do research about us or to involve us in their research. So donors have to also look through that uh, because some of these donors think that trans men can have HIV. That's why they end up not funding us for HIV programming and research, which is so dangerous. If we need to reach the 90-90-90 target, uh, we need to care for everyone, not just a few. Uh, um, and then uh, we need to, uh, uh, the people who carry out researches about us need to stop categorizing us into different people, like combining us with different people when they are carrying out the research. They need to carry, if it's a research being done, let it be trans-based only, not getting trans mixed with uh, gays, MSMs, and lesbians, because we are totally different. We also need to train different people, especially health service providers um, uh, and all people about trans and gender diverse issues. Trainings need to be carried out uh, so that people should know uh, how to deal with the trans people. I feel decentralization could be could be a way forward on this regarding the issue of uh, because I, I would gladly say back 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 home in Uganda there's a lot of cases of uh, self stigma and discrimination so just to tackling that 
I, I, I feel decentralization can be done for art and care treatment. Uh, this, I mean, the stigma and the discrimination that is in the health facilities that trans men go to and face that kind of discrimination from these biased health workers. Instead, uh, funding can be put into organizational drop-in centers. And these are the safe spaces that these people would feel are going to get mm -hmm. the services that they need without being judged. So if, if most emphasis was put in the organizational drop-in centers, I would get would actually get more numbers of people who test and uh, are willing to get on treatment without yeah. being yeah without living in fear of uh, the the judgment and the bias from from the health workers at uh, at the health facilities. Something else is uh, more more advocacy, more advocacy to be done, especially with the with the health with the health workers to increase awareness to them so that they can they can they can reduce or they can start engaging uh, really well with, with the trans community minus minus chasing them off or asking them bad questions or, or refusing to give them any services. I think a uh, trans men com uh, community needs to be included not only for uh, for uh, research but also uh, being a decision making body to to a HIV intervention strategy so the uh, we urge government CSOs and any development partners to include us and and make a research about us I should also say that uh, when we're given platforms we should also use our voices to advocate um, and sensitize in different spaces about trans and talk about what exactly we need instead of just keeping quiet because we are given a lot of opportunities and always keep quiet. So we need to use our voices. We need to utilize the spaces that we are always uh, given. In terms of research, I think one thing that's important for that I would really emphasize is that people just need to ask some basic questions. I think that sometimes researchers hear, oh, you need to do trans men specific studies, and they're like, oh my god, I don't know where to start. That seems like such a huge thing. I think it's important for there to be studies specific to trans men, but there are also lots of ways to do research that is responsive to trans men that doesn't involve doing a specific study. And a lot of it's just about asking. I mean, I know researchers who do, who thought they were doing research on cis gay men's health, who then at added questions to their studies about um, what um, uh, sex people were originally assigned at birth, like on their birth certificate, and lo and behold found out that there were a bunch of trans men already in their research who they didn't even yeah. know about, they hadn't bothered to ask. Um, I also last week saw a study, a few weeks ago saw a study um, of sex workers in Zimbabwe that was sex, all sex workers, but they asked people about gender and they actually had about 300 trans men who were sex workers in their study. Um, because they asked. I mean, I'm sure they did more than that, um, but they also um, just bothered to, uh, to ask those questions uh, about, um, about sex and gender. That's so important. And that's such a key point as well that, and that's what we've managed to do here, I think, at least a little bit in Australia, just getting included in existing long-term research projects that, uh, largely or only their gay community periodic surveys and working with the researchers to include an additional question about how someone was presumed at birth totally changed the way that the research project was being thought about, how yeah. it was being targeted, and suddenly lots of lots of trans men. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, like, again, if you ask the right questions, you also get the numbers. This is like the... the... <laughs> The key, like one of the key points. And um, we have a comment from our colleague, Magnus, who experiences a little bit of uh, technical issues. And he wrote a um, comment in the chat that I'm just going to read out for everyone. So I think going forward, donors need to do well and fund, fund trans men specific research without being merged our identities so that we can have data on trans men, especially trans health 
evidence-based research. And also there should be more support for trans work to help debunk some myths and misconceptions about the community. It is said that a lot of people think trans men cannot have HIV and other sexually transmitted disease. All this needs to be addressed and going forward. As a team too, we need to be there for each other, help grow other networks of trans by sharing ideas, resources to better help the network grow. In Ghana, where I come from specifically and some parts of West Africa, Africa trans education or awareness is very minimal. A lot of times we need the support of other trans folks. This is a colleague like Magnus from Ghana. The working group that we're doing, which is I think like a very unique aspect that we have 20 members from 17 different countries from all five continents. I think like this is, you know, like we, we exist, like we exist all around the world in every part of, this, of yeah. the world. And we need to be included. We need to be seen and we need to be, you know, like addressed mm -hmm. in each and every specific context that we live in. Uh, he said uh, we need to get drop-in centers for uh, that we can facilitate. This is really important especially if I look at uh, my country. We have uh, LGB organizations that have clinics and we, we, they discriminate us. We fear to go there for health services because yeah. there is a lot of discrimination and back talking and this makes us uncomfortable. A lot of um, my, uh, trans men have decided to go to private hospitals, get medication, and these are charged. So they end up sharing the drugs. Yeah, this yeah. has brought a lot of problems. So we really need to focus on uh, getting our own drop-in centers or places that can provide health services specifically for the trans. That is when a lot of people will come up and the conception that trans, trans men don't, can't have HIV has led a lot of people, a, a lot of trans men not to come out because they fear a lot of questioning is going to be there. So that is why actually, if we go back to the data, we don't get uh, the right information because there are yeah. some trans men who never come out. They fear, there is a lot of fear within them. Yeah. So this is quite a big challenge. I just wanted to add um, with the regards to funding, um, it, that funding sources really need to invest in us. And by investing in us, uh, that is not uh, taking money away from trans women and research uh, and prevention like funding that is uh, specific for trans women. It's not a pie that we're gonna divide up. Uh, that funding source needs to be added because um, yeah. otherwise that really does divide our community. We're not here, we're not at, I, at IAS. You know, there are 20 of us in this organization. There were 15 of us at the last IAS. So investing in us means starting at the beginning of what investing in a key population or a potential key population looks like. We don't sit on the community advisory boards. We don't sit on the country monitoring mechanisms. We're not part of those conversations and we can't be meaningfully part of them unless you start at the at the beginning with us, yeah. with mentoring programs, with being sure that we're at the table, but also with making sure that we have access to the kinds of resources that a 30 year response has given to some of the other key populations uh, and, and we haven't been part of. Uh, so in terms yeah. of sort of thinking about what investing in us looks like, it, it really means conceptualizing a long-term investment strategy, not just dropping someone into a conversation to represent a community that has never been on parity in these discussions before and expecting that to immediately change the world. It, 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 it really means starting at the bottom. Thank you so much. Like This is, I think, a very great closing point of like what needs to be done on like a like on various different levels and i thank everyone for this super powerful session for your time and uh, your input and i hope that that this will actually change something thank you hi everyone and welcome to our q a uh, i hope you enjoyed our session so far with a brilliant introduction from mauro and um now we have a q a um with a little bit of a technical issue because right now uh, we need to figure out how to access um, the questions. And what I'm going to 
do right now is, first of all, I would like to thank also to the other um, panel members who at the moment cannot be part of this chat, unfortunately, or this Q&A. So big, big thank you to Teddy, Abby, Marshall, Marion, and Magnus um, for giving all their input and insight. And I would just like to start with a question from myself to our uh, panel members right now. So what actually are your hopes and ex expectations after this session and after this conference? So I just opened the floor to anyone. Um, like, what do you think about like, what is going to happen like after our session today, which is basically also like a historical moment and historical event of the first like trans masculine led program points in the history of the of the AIDS conferences, uh, which I'm very proud of that we all made this possible. And also thanks to Erica from GATE uh, to, to help us to actually get into, uh, get a satellite session uh, going. So Hello, everyone. I'm Jay from Uganda. And uh, uh, I would like to respond to Max's question. Uh, my expectation after this, I expect uh, a lot of involvement for the trans people in different researches that are being done because uh, the researches that are always done, they don't involve trans men. So I think I expect a lot of people who have viewed this uh, uh, video to include us in more researches that are going to be done. And also um, I expect donors to come on board and support our work as a trans man so that we can do, be able to do different researches, do work, uh, that involves the trans men uh, uh, because a lot of we are facing a lot of we need uh, uh, health service provision for the trans people for the trans men especially uh, like setting up the DIC uh, uh, like being involved in different researches so I expect my expectations are that uh, different people will be able to come and join us thank you yeah, and in terms of expectations on my side, what what I'd love to see right away is more questions being asked, which means people reaching out to GATE and to the Transmen and HIV Working Group to try to figure out what the gaps look like, because this session is not nearly enough for anyone watching it to go away and say, I know what to do, I'm going to fix my stuff. No, no. Uh, what you know what to do is to contact us or to contact other trans men led uh, organizations and networks in, in a local area. And often those organizations are support groups uh, where we're providing direct support to other trans masculine uh, folks, either non-binary folks or trans men in, in our local communities. Those organizations need to be involved in conversations, but so do organizations whose job is more about policy, about understanding the larger framework uh, and that, that's where the working group specifically comes in, is being less focused on direct service or direct support delivery and more on bringing together all of this uh, body of knowledge from different transmasculine folks around the world within the area of HIV so we can build a stronger response. So the piece that I think there is there is start writing an email to us. <laughs> uh, so that we can have a more detailed conversation about how to integrate us into the work that you either are doing or want to do. Body of knowledge from different transmasculine folks around the world yeah. within the area of HIV so we can build a stronger response. So the piece that I think there is there is start writing an email to. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I mean, um... I think this this has been also like really like like key points in our in our uh, presentation or in the in the in the thirty minutes video that you watched is like how to ask the right questions like if we are not being included if we are not you know like if you if you don't know what is going on in our lives in our bedrooms and whatever um, like how do you how do you want to know how to to ask the right questions and what is like from your experience, what do you think um, is a good way, like you said, like 
go and like write an email, but like, what do you think is a good way of like how to approach trans groups, trans organizations um, in this matter? Max, may I say something? Yes, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I I want to want to say that uh, the video that you saw uh, today and and you know all of this conversation that seems to be so natural took years and years to be possible. Um, it's um, it has been quite challenging to make room for for our issues. And I'm really deeply moved by the opportunity of being here and for us to ha be have been having this conversation. And, and there are two things that I want, I want to say to people in different communities and even allies that maybe are thinking, well, but in my community, this, this is not happening. But actually, we are sure that it is happening, that there are trans men in your LGTBI community that right now are being left out, you know, conversations on 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 HIV uh, and trans issues or men's issues. The other thing is that maybe you are thinking that they are not uh, in your community. There is no knowledge, no interest, or there are actually no people. I, as a trans man who have sex with men, I have heard many times. Uh, that we are exceptional and actually that, you know, people will say in my country, this is not happening. Well, actually in your country, we are pretty sure this is, this is happening. So the first step I would say to answer your question is to acknowledge that we exist. The trans men exist, the trans men bodies are real, that our sexualities are real and that our vulnerability to HIV is real, that the knowledge is there that you know the that data needs to be collected and analyzed and and shared so i think that recommending that first step is really an a need to improve the the full or to get to the full inclusion of trans men in this in this field there is a second concern that is uh, one of the elephants in the in the room every time that we talk about these issues, which is the issue of funding, and I would I I want to be really clear uh, on this. There are many people that believe that including trans uh, men in the HIV respond is going uh, to cause that other communities are going to lose money. Uh, we need to fight, you know, for not only for a piece of pie for, you know, for trans men, we need like a, like a, a bigger pie for everyone. So it's not about some communities losing money because we are being counted, uh, yeah. but we need to work together to get more support for everyone. And that's part of the invitation that we want to share with, with everyone today. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for this important point. And um, also, uh, again, sorry for the technical inconvenience of not like being able to receive your questions right now from the audience. But again, to point out that um, I will be uh, available in 15 minutes or like right after the session, basically, in the trans networking zone in the global village. Please join us there. Um, I'm happy to, to answer questions. Um, whatever came up during the session or um, like how to get in touch with us if you're interested in the work that we're doing. And um, yeah, I mean, like, I would like to, to leave the, the floor to the rest of the panel if there's any anything else you would like to, to add, like if there's maybe like a, a last point that we have forgotten in our discussions um, and uh, like that needs to be still said um, in the last 60 seconds that we have. I'll take 20 of those if I can, just to say uh, that when reaching out to, to organizations and populations you haven't worked with before, that has to mean that you are willing to rethink the project so that it fits that population as well. Maybe that means that money needs to be spent in different ways. There are different goals. There are different research aims. There are different service provision aims, but you, you can't, it will not work to take an existing program and just say, okay, now it's open to trans men. Uh, we know very clearly from our experience with, as, as Jay mentioned, I think in the actual video, 
LGB led health provision uh, systems that are all of a sudden trying to include us don't serve us because they didn't have us in mind in the beginning. It's a big ask, but you have you have to mean it when you say that you want to do work uh, yeah. with with trans masculine folks. Yeah. Yeah. On the other, I mean, the other thing I wanted to say, um, which is, I think from a different angle, perhaps, than what Keenan was pointing out, um, from a research perspective, is that it's also not rocket science. I think I keep on, I always say that to folks, and I think it's quite important. There are a lot of examples I've seen recently of people um, recognizing that there often isn't specific funding to do research on trans men, people uh, leveraging existing funding, existing research projects, and simply saying, okay, we're actually going to ask people um, about their assigned sex of birth and their gender identity, and lo and behold, there were trans men in our data all along. Um, who we just weren't recognizing because we weren't asking really basic questions. Um, and so I think for people who are doing research that isn't necessarily about trans men, um, to simply be asking, um, uh, making trans men in their studies um, visible and, and, low, and then being able to build on that to then get at questions that might be specific uh, to trans men. But I don't think the fact that somebody cannot launch a full scale study specific to trans men is an excuse to do nothing. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Jay, do you have anything to add from your perspective? Uh, not, not really, but um, I just, whoever uh, wants to come on board, as uh, Kenan said, that you have to always mean it. If you want us, if you want, you really want to work with that, please make sure that you mean it. Uh, it's not just for the sake of, including us just for the sake, but please mean it when you're coming on board to work with the trans men. Yeah, I think that is a really good point to actually also end this session on like to really like as a, as a call for action, include us and do the work right and mean it. Um, and maybe in two years, we will have a different discussion um already let's see i'm i'm hopeful and thank you so much for everyone who has joined the session and yeah enjoy the rest of the conference thank you thank you bye everyone